review surgery. He will bring us a topic about uh, robotics and AI. <laughs> Well, I wore this hat to be ironic. First of all, I have kind of a, a bald head. I could use a hat. Second of all, the hat says boring. That may be a comment on the talk you're about to hear. But many of you know that this is Elon Musk's kind of company. And of course, Elon Musk is convinced that very shortly, AI is going to be taking over and we're all stuck in a virtual reality loop. So uh, having said that, I will try to break the mold. So what we're going to be talking about now is outside of everything you're going to hear today. This is not industrial. It's about healthcare, Because I would like to suggest that that's where AI may have its biggest impact. I mean, by virtue of what AI tries to achieve, you know, duplicate human effort, human cognition, uh, there is no deeper level of human cognition, I think, and no more labor-intensive field in the world today than healthcare which of course eats up to 18% of GNP in America. And so what you're going to hear about specifically right now is my current effort, along with uh, Terry, um, to try to take a technology that was created here at Stanford, and well renowned at Stanford, uh, image guided radio surgery, and to take that technology using some modern AI principles to try to reach two million patients a year, which we feel have unmet need in the world of cancer. Well, what is radio surgery? I'm going to suggest radio surgery right now is the most sophisticated treatment in the world today. That's, that's a, a bold statement, isn't it? Why? Well, because it's quite effective, painless, it's very low risk, and very low cost. I mean, it's hard to find something bad with radio surgery today, except I'm going to give you a few in a second. In fact, this is an example of what radio surgery does. A patient has that brain tumor, goes into a machine, and 30 minutes later, the tumor is dead. Generally takes a couple months to achieve that effect, but that is, in fact, what radio surgery does. No pain. You literally, and I've had patients ride their bicycle over to parts of Stanford campus, get treated, and then ride their bicycle home to Mountain View. That's what radio surgery is. In fact, it has transformed the field, my chosen field of neurosurgery, almost completely. Since the field developed about 30 years ago, it's now the most common operation for brain tumor. We treat around the world 150,000 patients, and we've treated a few million patients cumulatively over the last 30 years. There's a lots of excitement in the field because we think the most common brain tumors, metastasis, should now be treated with radio surgery. And we have good reason to believe it works very well with this revolution that we're seeing in immune modulation, which is transforming the way we treat all cancers. So radiation, radio surgery, is going hand in glove with what we think of as modern cancer treatment. But now we look around the world and we say this revolution that I'm talking to you about, that I think is so magnificent, we look around the world and we say, well, if it's so wonderful, how come we're only treating 150,000 patients every year, yet it looks like more than 2 million patients need this procedure. Something's not right. Well, why are we treating more patients? Well, it's expensive. This technology is arguably the most expensive technology in all of healthcare today. The most. Talk about Da Vinci robots, they're nothing compared to what we do. So, not only is the technology expensive, but it requires a very complex, expensive hospital facility to protect the operator. Literally, a hospital like Stanford can spend a few million dollars building such a radio therapy vault. But next, the concept of using this technology requires a lot of experience. It's complex. It takes years of training to learn how to use it well. But in the end, this little list of reasons means two million patients a year don't have access to a proven technology we know about. So what are we doing? Well, we're Silicon Valley, and we're Foxconn, right? So what we've done is we've put together a next generation product, a hardware platform, that's only part of the story, using a different energy linear accelerator so that we can wrap the radiation inside the device itself so we don't need a special vault. And we've optimized this, made it better just to treat brain and head and neck tumors. And we tried to simplify it 
but very importantly, we're trying to simplify it and give the next generation of surgeons AI tools so that they don't need years of training. So that in places like Indonesia and much of China and Brazil and Peru and Russia, you don't need to go through seven, eight years of subspecialty training to do these things. Because as I'm going to show you as the next five, ten minutes proceed, is that much of healthcare is this way. We're in the cusp of replacing a lot of high cost labor with smart software. In the end, we think we are on the cusp of producing a much lower cost, much easier to use technology that will go around the world and treat the two million patients that I so much care about wanting to see have access to treatment. And so this, if you come back to San Carlos, you can see this big gyroscope-like device. It looks like Joey Foster's contact machine, but it looks as dramatic looking, and it's dramatic because it needs to achieve untold degrees of freedom in targeting tumors. How does radio surgery work? It works by focusing as much energy as you can on a sphere at a point in space, like a magnifying glass. You converge these points of energy, you now have a, a really a therapeutic source of energy at the point of convergence. That is radio surgery, and that's what this mechanical device attempts to achieve. So you wrap it all up, and this is what a more modern device looks like. And this is, in fact, what a little video will shop, talk you through the process. So you see how we would treat a patient. Inside, it's, we contain imaging and targeting and a linear accelerator and a, and a collimator that carefully shapes the dose of radiation in untold ways that have never been achieved before. And this is all backed by a real-time sensor that confirms you're delivering the dose that you're delivering that's never been achieved before. But it's this cocoon of equipment contains the radiation so you don't need to uh, shield the operator from the radiation. And so you can really, really put the device right here. But on top of this is a veneer of software that makes it possible for places like Vietnam and India for the first time to do very, very sophisticated techniques technological treatments. That is the next generation of medicine. And as you can see, AI concepts and techniques have an important role in it. And it should be noted that the very first generation AI-directed radiosurgical system made by me was made right across the street here in the AI complex, what well, was the AI complex 30 years ago in Cedar Hall. So we just anointed a, uh, there was kind of a celebration in Wisconsin where Foxconn, is now building a huge complex to really rejuvenate American manufacturing. And uh, we're fortunate enough to be one of the new many tenants in the Foxconn complex. And this is where we'll be making the Zapdex machine. So we aspire, with the help of Foxconn and AI tools, to really revolutionize the way brain cancer is being treated these days. We've created and are creating a best-in-class technology at an affordable price. That's what's nice about AI. It makes everything so much scalable. And I might add that this technology was recently just granted six months ago, granted <coughs> FDA clearance, and we'll treat our next first patient next month. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> but ultimately, it's a chance to advance healthcare worldwide. But importantly, if you're going to treat two million patients, you need to take the skills that someone like me or my colleagues have spent 20, 30 years acquiring and make it possible for them in, the, in less developed countries to treat out of the gate. Moreover, here, this is another one of my projects. This is a medical journal, which is trying to transform the way <coughs> medical journalism is done in this world. 99% of the physicians in the world don't have access to medical journals. They don't publish them and they don't hardly don't read. Yet they are caring for the vast majority of patients in the world. It takes great knowledge and sophistication to write a peer, a peer review journal. This journal is trying to create a series of AI tools to make everyday nurse surgeons, everyday surgeons, everyday practitioners of medicine, whether you be in Taiwan, whether you be in India, whether you be in rural America, capable of reporting significant clinical findings. Just as an aside, HIV, how, who knows how old HIV is and disease is? Who, else, who knows? Make a guess. It, was, it appeared in the 1980s. How old is HIV? 
it actually looks like it goes back to the early 1900s. For 70 or 80 years, HIV existed as a disease in Africa, and we didn't know it because the doctors in the world couldn't report it. And that's why AI and the publication process can transform the way medical knowledge is generated and curated. Where else can we see AI in healthcare? Natural laboratory machine processing of clinic notes. The average resident in America, in a hospital in America, is now spending 70, 80 percent of their time not taking care of patients, but writing notes. <coughs> what about AI-assisted clinical diagnosis for rare diseases? This is whole unmet distance that we're just starting to touch into. And lastly, what we really see a lot of progress on recently is machine learning and radiographic and histologic diagnosis. So there's a lot coming down the pipeline, and with <laughs> Professor Glow, <Blow, laughs> I think we're going to make great strides going forward. So with that, I will let the next speaker come over and take over. Thank you.